to speak about a resource that has broad applicability to cancer control researchers and practitioners alike. Doctors Inam Peng and Ms. Devin Asako Schumacher are both scientists with the Community Guide branch at the CDC. Inan and Devin will deliver a presentation about the Community Preventive Services Task Force and a systematic review of evidence. Dr. Heather Dacus, Director of the Bureau of Cancer Prevention and Control in the New York State Department of Health, will discuss their success in using a multi-component approach to increase screening rates across the state. Complete biographies of our speakers can be found on R2R, researchreality.cancer.gov. Just a few housekeeping items before I turn it over to today's speaker. You'll notice that we've transitioned to WebEx platform and have muted all the lines. And we ask that you please keep your phone on mute for the duration of today's presentation. As I mentioned earlier, the session is being recorded and muting all lines will help us avoid any background noise. We had close to 600 people register for this program and we anticipate that the archive will be highly sought after. So we really would like to get a very nice recording um, for those of our colleagues that can't be on the call right now. The question and answer session is always my favorite part of these cyber seminars, and I really look forward to your sharing your thoughts and questions with us. While we won't be fielding the questions over the phone, they can be submitted using the Q&A feature at the top of the screen, on the right-hand side of your screen. You could just type your question in the provided field and submit. You can submit your question at any point during the presentations, um, but we'll be leaving time for the questions at the end and really look forward to having a robust back and forth with our present presenters. And finally, we specifically and warmly welcome those of you who are joining us for the first time to engage in discussion today on the call and online on the Research Reality Community Practice. We're so excited for joining us today. And now I'll get ready to bring it back to um, our speakers, and we're just really pleased to have everybody with us today. So, Inam, with all our housekeeping done, I'm delighted to turn this over to you and Devin. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Margaret, for that introduction. So, this is Inam Payne from the Community Guide, and I will be do giving a brief overview of uh, Community Preventive Services Task Force. Uh, who we are, what we do, and, uh, and then I'll hand this over to Devin for a more in-depth uh, presentation on the cancer review in, uh, in particular. So what is the community guide? Um, I just want to say that here we have our uh, website link right there, uh, thecommunityguide.org. Uh, please go to our website. We have a new website that's very interactive, and you can search for um, the interventions that might interest you, and we provide as much supporting material as we, uh, we think are uh, useful to provide ways that uh, uh, you can use our uh, review findings in your, uh, in your line of work. And just briefly, uh, the task force um, has a panel of uh, public health experts. And uh, so we at a community guide uh, conducted systematic reviews and the task force review our work and eventually issue recommendations based on our review work. Uh, you, you probably are familiar with uh, United States Preventive Services Task Force, what we call USPSTF. Um, they they are, their reviews are more from the clinical perspective, more individual-based uh, interventions, such as uh, cancer screening tests. And uh, we, CPSTF, the Community Preventive Services Task Force, is the sister organization, and we go more from the public health perspective, so interventions that could be implemented at the community level um, that can uh, possibly have more impact on the population level. And I just want to go over a little bit of uh, what, uh, why we're called sister organization and where we overlap. So using today's uh, review as an example for breast, cervical, and colorectal cancer screening, the USPSTF, our sister organization, will be asking, is the screening itself effective? So if you, come to, if you go through a colonoscopy, pep test, or mammography at a certain age, at a certain interval, is that going to help uh, detect the cancer early enough to reduce cancer-related morbidity and mortality? 
And once the USPSTF determines that these tests are effective, then we, the CPSTF, we ask what interventions can we implement that to increase this kind of screening. So uh, these are probably uh, familiar examples to you guys, client reminders, provider reminders, or reducing structural barriers. And slide 11 and 12 just uh, cover the topics that we currently have on our website. And please feel free to explore. And uh, so how do we achieve our impact? We issue, the task force issue these uh, recommendations and hopefully it can be used by CDC programs, by uh, state local health departments, by organizations and uh, agencies, and also researchers, decision makers, and just frontline public health uh, workers. For all of our reviews, these are the set of questions we ask. The first and foremost, of course, is does this intervention work? Once we find out it works, then we have additional questions we want to ask. How well does it work? Uh, for which population and what kind of circumstances? And does it influence health disparity? What's the cost and benefit of implementing this kind of intervention? And here is kind of a schematic of uh, what we consider in our reviews. So there is the intervention impacting the population, producing intended intervention outcomes, hopefully reducing morbidity and mortality downstream. The other factors we consider are barriers to implementing this kind of interventions, what are some additional benefits and potential harms associated with the intervention? What are some key effect modifiers? Is some, there's some factor that's actually going to influence the intervention effectiveness? And we, uh, for interventions that's recommended, we conduct economic uh, review to see the cost and benefit of the intervention. And very importantly, we ask, is this uh, the evidence we collect, is it applicable to specific populations? So is it applicable, uh, for example, uh, within the community or only for clinical setting and things like that? To reach a recommendation, we need a body of evidence. So it needs to be more than one study. And we assess the, how suitable the study design is, what's the quality. And this body of evidence needs to show effectiveness. So is the effect consistent and is, is the effect meaningful? Um, the meaningfulness of the effect is sometimes could be difficult to determine, but uh, it's, not a, it's not a case for today's presentation. As you later see, we have a quite sizable change in cancer screening rates. And here are the recommendations issued by the task force. So it could be recommended with strong or sufficient evidence. It could be recommended against when the harm far outstrips the benefit or it could be insufficient evidence, which means at current stage there is just not enough evidence to determine the effectiveness one way or another. And now I turn the presentation over to Devin for the uh, review on multi-component interventions to increase cancer screening. Thank you, Inan. As I'm sure you all know, cancer is the second leading cause of death in the U.S and screening can help reduce mortality and incidence if linked with appropriate follow-up. However, current use is below our 2020 targets for breast, cervical, and colorectal cancer screening, and rates are even lower for underserved populations. On this slide and the next, we have the findings from our single component reviews, all of which um, are posted on our website, so if you'd like some more information, please feel free to check it out. Um, many of these interventions out in the real world, though, are actually implemented together in combination. So we decided to take a closer look at the effectiveness of multi-component interventions. And here we have a list of the different approaches we included in the review, and we separated them out into three strategies, increasing community demand, increasing community access, and increasing provider delivery. For our review, multi-component interventions were any combination of two or more of these approaches um, or two or more of the approaches that reduce different structural barriers. The main goal of our review was to determine how effective multi-component interventions were at increasing screening, but like Enon says, there were a few other things that we looked at. We wanted to know whether effectiveness varied by the number of approaches, or the type of approaches or the strategies used. 
We included 88 studies in our review, most of which were implemented in the U.S. and many in urban areas. Many were implemented among predominantly low-income populations and most used two approaches. This plot shows the overall effectiveness of the interventions, um, and we separated them out into three different types of cancer that we were looking at. So up top we have breast cancer, below that cervical, and below that colorectal. Each red dot is an effect estimate from a study arm that represents the absolute percentage point change in cancer screening. And medians are represented by the vertical dotted lines. As you can see, the interventions increased breast, cervical, and colorectal cancer screening. And the median was a little bit larger for colorectal cancer. And we think that's probably due to the lower baseline screening rates among those studies. And previously, we didn't have enough evidence to say anything about colonoscopy, but for this review, we were able to determine that the interventions were effective at increasing colonoscopy use. And we looked at the data based on the different strategies used, and we saw that the largest increases were for interventions that combined approaches to increase community demand and access, and that's that top red box, and then interventions that combined all three strategies, and that's the second red box. We also looked at the data by the different approaches used. Um, we saw it increases across the number of approaches, um, across the different approaches used, and across the different structural barriers addressed. And we saw very large increases for interventions that provided language translation or that addressed trans transportation issues. We also looked at interventions that were implemented among underserved populations. We found that they were effective among predominantly low-income populations, among populations with low rates of insurance, among those implemented in federally qualified or community health centers, and for those um, that involved patient navigators and community health workers. And here we have the task force finding. The task force recommends multi multi-component interventions for increasing screening use for breast, cervical, and colorectal cancers. And we saw the largest effects for interventions that combined approaches for increasing community demand and access, and for those that combine approaches across all three strategies. There are several things to consider when implementing these interventions. Um, first, we think it's important to think about the specific needs for your population and to use the strategies and approaches that best address these needs. And we found interventions to be effective across multiple populations, including low-income and uninsured. We also think it's important to ensure that you're offering proper follow-up to care. And another thing that we wanted to point out is that the interventions that require access to the internet or computers or smartphones might be costly and they might not be feasible for some participants. Um, and an important thing to think about also is the appropriateness of materials used when targeting specific populations. If you'd like to learn more about our review, um, please check out our review summaries on our website, and here are the links. And please help us share our findings. We've, um, we have links to an announcement you can use to share with your networks, as well as one-page summaries. And you can sign up to receive news and information from the Community Guide, and you can tailor your profile to get information that you're interested in. And ah, thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Devin and Jan. What a great presentation. Um, looking forward now, um, Heather, we're swinging it over um, to you. Great. Thanks, Margaret. Thanks, Devin. I now have control. Go to the next slide. Okay, here we go. Well, I want to say good afternoon to everybody. Uh, my name is Heather Dacus, and as Margaret mentioned, I'm the director for the Bureau of Cancer Prevention and Control here at the New York State Department of Health in Albany, New York. I want to thank very much uh, the CDC and the NCI for reaching out to us a few months ago to ask us to write up our work and how it has been informed by the Community Guide to Preventive Services, which really has been an excellent resource for us. 
I also want to publicly thank my staff here at the New York State Department of Health who work really hard every day to implement the work I'm sharing, and also our contractors and our partners who are key to success of all these projects across the state. So as I mentioned, I oversee the Bureau of Cancer Pre and Pre Prevention and Control, and we use our state and federal funds to uh, aim to reduce the burden of cancer for all New Yorkers through coordination with partners and contractors and implementing population and evidence-based strategies. As many of you I'm, I know can relate, the burden of cancer is high in general across our whole country and here in New York State, about 108,000 people are diagnosed with cancer every year with about 35,000 people uh, dying of cancer. And specifically, over 25,000 New York residents are diagnosed with breast, cervical, or colorectal cancer every year here in New York State. Over the last five to 10 years, we've really strived to use the framework of the community guide and these proven evidence-based interventions to inform both our program development and also our evaluation planning. So it's been, a, again, like I said, a great resource to us and I'm sure to many of you as well. The first and main program I want to cover is our New York State Cancer Services Program, which is such an important program to us here in New York State. The main aim of the Cancer Services Program is to increase cancer screening rates among the uninsured and underinsured. This program is conducted across the state by 35 Cancer Services Program contractors. And using both uh, CDC and state funds, uh, the 35 CSP contractors aim to reduce structural barriers using that evidence-based intervention by conducting a number of activities such as the ones I've listed here. And many of you are familiar with this program. The CDC funding is the National Breast and Cervical Cancer Early Detection Program. So I'm sure many people can relate to the use of this evidence-based intervention. Um, and again, it's been quite a success. And the CSP here in New York State has been in existence for nearly 25 years. And even with more people accessing insurance over the past few years through the Affordable Care Act, in 2016, over 22,000 adults received at least one Cancer Services Program funded uh, screening test. And the success of the work of the contractors is really evident by that, and also that over 80% of clients need to follow up on abnormal results, uh, get that follow up within 60 days, and those in need of treatment, 94% oh, initiate that treatment within 60 days. The second project I want to highlight, and again, I'm, I'm providing a big overview of a number of projects and how it's been informed by the community guide, but the second one I'll highlight is our work with, uh, within Central and Western New York and the State University of New York at Syracuse to implement academic detailing and practice facilitation. Academic detailing aims to send trained professionals into healthcare provider offices to provide tailored education and provide guidance on best practices and then trained professionals, practice facilitators, provide one-on-one -on -one coaching to practices to help them develop systems and workflows around things such as data collection and EHR data cleaning, which I know many people can relate is a lot of work up front when you first start working with a healthcare practice. And then these practice facilitators also do great work to either implement new or help enhance existing uh, systems that are in place, such as provider reminders, uh, client reminder systems, and um, provider assessment and feedback. Uh, this slide depicts uh, baseline uh, information that we gathered from participating practices in 2014-15 year compared to one year later, how had evidence-based interventions uh, changed or increased at the practice sites? And you can see um, the increase in adoption of evidence-based interventions here depicted on the slide. And in one of the project years, um, so far average screening rates uh, for breast cancer increased by 13% and by about 5.6% for colorectal cancer. We've learned a lot about practice facilitation and its benefits, and some of these are listed here, such as we know that practice facilitation um, really helps and the practices uh, really engage when the activities align with their existing priorities, such as patient-centered medical home certification. And then also the project champions, the staff within the practice are a really important source of encouragement, not just for implementing things for a provider, but then spreading successes across the entire practice. 
Another project I want to highlight uh, is the newest one to us and involves working with our state Medicaid colleagues. We, working with the Medicaid colleagues and using data that comes in to New York State for Medicaid claims, we identified two rural upstate New York regions with a notably lower colorectal cancer screening rate among Medicaid managed care enrollees. We're partnering with, again, the state Medicaid colleagues and also with three Medicaid managed care plans to improve colorectal cancer screening rates in the populations in these regions by implementing evidence-based patient and provider interventions. This slide shows to date the evidence-based interventions that this project is utilizing with the greatest emphasis uh, being on the, in the item here in the box, a patient reminder system. So the project has worked to get information out to providers, um, but really to um, mail out letters to Medicaid managed care enrollees who are not up to date uh, with their screening and then within the communication to them, letting them know that they have access to transportation through their Medicaid plans if they need it to help reduce uh, that structural barrier. So this slide uh, shows the patient reminder letter. It's quite small. I uh, apologize that you can't really read the, the verbiage, but in one upstate rural region, our Adirondack region, nearly 4,000 Medicaid managed care members, again, not up to date with screening, were mailed a letter encouraging them to go talk to their doctor about getting screened, and also an additional 2,000 Medicaid managed care enrollees were mailed a similar letter that included the offer of a $25 money order um, if they were screened. This slide shows the provider letter. So our Medicaid managed care plan partners actually took it upon themselves to get these letters out to the providers in these regions that these patients are assigned to so that they were made aware that the project was happening um, to provide them with some information about continuing medical education on colorectal cancer screening and then just to help uh, ask them to uh, please encourage and, and help their patients to get screened. So we've done this now in each of the two upstate regions and as you can see here on, on this slide, in comparison to the usual care group who didn't get the letter sent from us, the screening rates really aren't all that impressive. So, you know, we're not um, deterred by that. Uh, instead, what we're doing is looking at the, the project and the evidence-based interventions and really try to layer on additional EBIs. Uh, so, for example, future rounds in one of the upstate regions is going to involve um, a call to some of these clients in addition to the letter so we can test to see if that uh, helps to enhance outcomes. Patient navigation is another key area we've been focusing on of late, and I'm sure many audience members have experience with this as well. Patient navigation itself is a key intervention aimed at reducing structural barriers. Uh, trained staff can help outreach or inreach to patients in need of screening, and then also work with patients to identify barriers and implement resolutions. We've conducted two demonstration projects in two different federally qualified health centers a few years ago, one in upstate rural region and one down in the city, where we really learned the value of these trained patient navigation staff. You know, not only do they help um, increase screening rates, but just the, 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 the workload that they take off of nurses and busy uh, providers the way that they can assist with tracking down already performed screening test results, the way that they educate patient populations to really get at the, the barriers that are in place are so just invaluable. And the three uh, programs that are here in this box are our current uh, projects that relate to patient navigation. And the next slide is just one slide showing, so right now we have 33 contracts with nationally accredited programs, uh, breast centers in New York State. This is an accreditation for American College of Surgeon uh, breast centers. And these 33 are working with us uh, doing patient navigation. And you can see in just the nine months that these contracts have been in place, the numbers have been increasing for how many of these folks are reaching to offer patient navigation, um, how many are subsequently being referred to screening and the numbers being screened. So in nine months, we're seeing some good outcomes and uh, expect to uh, continue to see that. We also have projects aimed 
at strengthening evidence-based approaches through policy, so through our paid time off for cancer screening project, our cancer services program contractors in the upstate region uh, are educating employers about how lack of paid time off is a potential barrier to obtaining recommended cancer screening. And so these contractors are working with municipalities in their areas or local employers to educate them about the benefits of, of offering paid time off. And to date, 24 work sites across the state have implemented or expanded policies that allow folks to um, take time off without charging their sick accruals to, um, to go get screened. With an approximate reach so far of over 13,000 people have access to these new policies. From a big P policy perspective, uh, we were happy last year that Governor Andrew Cuomo here in New York State implemented key legislation to reduce structural barriers to breast cancer screening. So um, my bureau certainly can't take credit for that, but our governor did an excellent job of uh, implementing some good legislation, including uh, requiring that over 200 hospitals, uh, hospitals with uh, mammography facilities are now uh, required to offer an additional four hours per week of mammography appointment times outside of the normal nine to five uh, work day. And then these other legislation, excuse me, legislative pieces were um, implemented as well. Um, when funding allows, it's, it's, it's fantastic when uh, you're able to uh, create um, media campaigns because certainly this is one of those areas that can really help with patient uh, education. And we were very lucky over the last few years to have access to some, some funding to use tested messages from the National Colorectal Cancer Roundtable to develop a multimedia statewide campaign to promote colorectal cancer screening. And you can see um, here on the slide a number of items um, that were created, including commercials, uh, banner ads on websites. And if you're at all interested in seeing the landing page or looking at the commercials that were produced, uh, the link to that landing page is here at the bottom of this slide. Oops. Oh, there it goes. Okay, sorry, my slide was not advancing. And then we also uh, took some opportunities to really look at whether the multimedia campaign over the last two years had any impact. And you can see here that there's been some measurable impact. So television ads are an excellent referral source uh, to get people asking questions about colorectal cancer screening. So calls to our call center increased um, up to 21% in the first run of the campaign. Referrals to our cancer services program increased when the campaign ran. Um, from 33% up to 48% in March. And then we also had a mail and internet survey evaluation that was conducted, which showed um, that the, the media ads had definitely demonstrated effectiveness in terms of improving awareness and increasing people's intention to be screened. So again, that was an incredibly broad overview of uh, some of our cancer screening programs here at New York State Department of Health and being implemented across the state, but definitely for us over the years, being able to learn from others and, and specifically learning from others in other states, uh, looking at evidence-based interventions from uh, the community guide and really using those evidence-based approaches that work. And then to maximize impact, really look for opportunities to target evidence-based interventions to different um, target audiences, whether it be at healthcare systems or across community settings. And then, of course, um, we, we can't really show our success if we don't try to evaluate what we're doing. So evaluating interventions and sharing findings to spread lessons learned where we don't see much improvement, looking to layer on additional interventions, such as the Medicaid project I described. And then, you know, trying to educate others about the work that we do to improve sustainability. Uh, funding certainly is, is an issue. So, so if we can show that we are doing work that means something and that has good outcomes. Um, hopefully our chances of maintaining our funding uh, are maintained. So with that said, I just want to thank everybody again, CDC and the NCI, uh, for giving us this opportunity. It's, it's really quite um, humbling. Um, and Margaret, I will turn it over back to you. Great. Thank you so much. What a great presentation. I'm just so very um, appreciative. It's um, around 2.30 here in D.C. And you can tell that I um, made the speakers chop down all of their slides 
um, because we did want to make time for a robust discussion. So um, this is the right time then um, to, you know, transition over and give you the opportunity um, to join the discussion online. Um, we hope that you'll take a couple of minutes to type in your question on the Q&A screen. We have a number of questions that have already come in. So um, just type your question in and then um, hit send. So um, our first couple of questions, um, Heather, kind of come over to you, if that would be okay. And just some more details about the academic detailing and practice facilitation um, issue. Where, where, do you, where do you get funding for this initiative? And can you speak to um, if that's done within the um, Department of Health or through a separate organization? So great questions. Um, so our funding for the academic detailing and practice facilitation project uh, comes through our colorectal cancer grant and uh, partially on our breast and cervical early detection program grant. And we contract with the State University of New York uh, in, in upstate New York, Syracuse, New York. Uh, they happen to be a practice-based research network. Uh, we put out a, a funding opportunity a few years ago looking for an entity that could do this kind of work, and uh, SUNY Upstate in Syracuse was the uh, successful applicant. So SUNY in Syracuse uh, works with um, different practices across Rochester, Buffalo, and Syracuse. And they have a network of trained professionals that provide the academic detailing. They've even developed uh, webinars um, that the practices can use in subsequent years when new staff come on board. And then they also, across um, each of the sites, they have a trained practice facilitators. And these practice facilitators engage with practices. You have to you know, do a lot of work to get a practice to agree to have somebody to come in and do the one-on-one -on -one coaching. But uh, that is what SUNY Upstate um, navigates and, and, and oversees um, and evaluates, quite frankly. So I hope that provides a little bit more information. No, that's great. Thanks so much. Um, a couple of questions um, that that come along those lines around um, policy initiatives. And maybe I'll start, um, Devin and Ingon, with you in terms of if someone is interested in working with legislators in shaping um, policy recommendations, is this something that's available through the newly revised community guide, or can you speak a little bit about how um, the community guide can be helpful in um, building capacity for um, public policy around cancer screening? So we have a pretty robust uh, dissemination, and uh, this is Yinan Ping, uh, we have a pretty robust dissemination and implementation team, and they kind of uh, go through like uh, US and find success stories that how people could use that recommendation, come up with uh, programs, or even sometimes change policies. And some of those success stories are posted on our website, and, uh, um, and they, they will be the ones more familiar with uh, the, the process. And so uh, we encourage you to just contact us. And on our website, there are places for you to submit questions, and someone at a guide will be able to provide some answers or further guidance or link you to a party that might be better able to answer these questions. And I think um, our colleague from New York State uh, probably has more hands-on experience with uh, changing policies. Great. Thanks, Nguyen. Thanks. Um, along those lines, then, Heather, um, a few questions, um, unless there was something you want to say about the, about the community guide and policy, I'm sorry. No, no, go ahead. Um, just, and then um, just like to kind of segment that we had a couple of questions in terms of um, looking for more information about some of the policies um, that you mentioned. So could you speak a little bit? Um, we have a question that came in that um, asked for um, more about the, the New York State law that offers paid time off for cancer screening, as well as a little bit more information about the elimination of annual deductibles and co-pays for mammography. Can you talk about how that's kind of playing out in New York State? 
Sure. So as, as it relates to paid time off for screening, um, there has been a New York State law in place for uh, quite a number of years that allows uh, state employees to um, take four hours of time off without charging their accruals for breast, for breast cancer screening. And um, what the what what what's happening across the state is education to municipalities about um, that existing law. So number one, that people know about it and and use it, but then also um, you know whether or not local municipalities have interest in expanding on that existing state law and um, modifying the the policy at the local level to to add additional cancers such as colorectal cancer, so that people can also take time off for that. So not only with local municipalities, though, at the local level, um, folks are, are educating um, other employer types, you know, maybe employer types that, that don't have a lot of benefits or, or that do, but, but would benefit from um, adding a policy for time off for cancer screening. And uh, there's been a lot of materials developed to help support those education um, events. And so we could certainly provide more detail about that. Um, if people are interested. As it relates to the legislation that I mentioned that was enacted last year by our governor here in New York State, Governor Cuomo, one of them was eliminating annual deductibles, copayments, and coinsurance, or is cost sharing essentially for all screening mammograms, including those that might be provided more frequently than current federal screening guidelines would um, recommend, and also removing cost sharing for diagnostic imaging for breast cancer. So again, this was part of a package that Governor Cuomo was really interested in getting out so that uh, more barriers to screening, breast cancer screening, were uh, removed. So that's where that stands at the moment. No, these are great um, policy initiatives and great to see um, the support on, on both sides, both from the the legislation from your office too, from being able to move um, evidence-based interventions along with this, um, those mandates. Um, those of you who are on the call, I hope that you'll take some time to um, post onto the Research to Reality Community of Practice about evidence-based policy initiatives that you have going on in terms of um, multi-level interventions for screening all of these structural um, initiatives that are able to really kind of make a true difference in making um, screening accessible as well it, in every possible way. Um, a question also from um, Joanna Stomps who asks, um, how are the patient navigators funded? Heather. So our patient navigation projects, um, I mentioned that right now we have three projects going on. So we have patient navigation contract work happening um, through our eight downstate located cancer services program contractors, and, and that work happens through money from our, our state funding, um, as well the 33 nationally accredited breast centers in New York State. Um, each of those uh, entities, uh, we fund about $75,000 to uh, hire a patient navigator and implement uh, screening patient navigation. And again, I, as I mentioned, that was state funding. And then our five New York State federally qualified health centers um, that we have just started on October 1st, 2016 to do patient navigation, um, similar to the academic detailing and practice facilitation work, that work is funded across uh, our grants from CDC. Great, that's really so very helpful. Um, it, a question for um, all of you. Heather, it starts out with you, but certainly um, I'm sure there are resources on Community Guide that, that will be of help. Um, do you work with health communication professionals? And if so, um, what's their role? And also a thank you for a great presentation. Health communication professionals, yeah, so um, we have some excellent staff here in the Bureau uh, with communications background, and so they have uh, clearly been um, and helpful in helping to inform a lot of the program development and messaging. And then, you know, we have an, an excellent public affairs office that assists us with messaging. 
And then we try really hard, as I mentioned, we use the tested messages from the National Colorectal Cancer Roundtable to inform the colorectal cancer media campaign. So we try not to reinvent the wheel. We try to use things that have been tested. Um, and then, like I mentioned, we have some, some excellent staff to do all that good refinement. Great. Um, um, and then is, PVC, you know, I, I think that the, um, the outreach that's, that comes out about the community guide is exceptional in terms of how clearly it communicates um, the interventions and where to get resources. Can um, you two speak to um, how you're using health communication really kind of drive the message that these evidence-based programs are accessible um, across disease states? Um, yeah, so this is Inan again. Um, so we, over the years, uh, the entire CDC has been moving towards producing documents that are plain language that could be easily accessible by, um, by all the users. And we, at a guide, we have several health communication specialists. They help us draft our language and uh, create the one pagers, kind of summarizing our review findings. Uh, we do, when we do reviews, is uh, sometimes we can lose sight of uh, what we're if what we're saying is understandable. So we have definitely house uh, communication specialists uh, trying to help us with help us with that. And in this particular review, we did find that uh, a lot of the interventions when they were implemented in uh, um, uh, groups with language barriers and uh, and uh, uh, were pop special populations like that, they definitely need to have have uh, health communication in consideration. How do you draft a language that's both understandable and culturally acceptable uh, by the population you're uh, targeting? So it's a, it's a very important uh, issue to consider. Great, and I'll put another plug in. Enan had um, said about the success story that um, New York State um, is featured in the success stories really do kind of give a very broad sense of how exactly these interventions are playing out in the community level and can be great um, blueprints for other states and communities looking to replicate the success. Um, from NCI's point of view, we've never reached out to anybody um, who was featured in a success story that they weren't happy to follow up with us. So I think um, it's a great way both for um, communities to get their message out, but also for each of us to kind of have a better sense of um, who's doing what and, and how they're going about um, moving evidence-based programs into practice. Um, it, we have one last question that I think makes for a good sum up, but just a reminder, if you do have questions, um, now's the time to, to type them in. But um, a question to, to all three of you, um, and you can go as, as broad as you want, but given your, given your work and your experience and, and what you're seeing, what might you suggest as remaining areas for research regarding cancer screening promotion and implementation within healthcare centers? Is there something that as you move along in this process that you're interested in posing these research questions? Um, this is Inan, I'll just uh, go, because we do have, um, <clears throat> for all of our reviews, we do have a section that uh, specifically talks about evidence gaps. So it's kind of, uh, hopefully, there will be more people tr um, trying out new things and to provide uh, practice-based evidence and to, for us to incorporate and update our reviews to provide more information, um, hopefully that's useful to the field. And right now, one of our main thing is that we, of all the, even though we had 88 studies, and that's a huge number of studies, uh, we actually only have two or three studies that were looking at repeat uh, screening. So as you will know, all know, just screening for one time is not uh, enough that the people need to come back at regular intervals to do those kind of screenings. So if you are implementing this kind of programs, uh, assessing whether or not they can increase repeat screening uh, will be quite helpful. And uh, there's also um, the health literacy issue that um, as we go forward, more and more people, especially researchers, are paying attention to health literacy issue. How 
uh, at what level does the message need to be created at so, so that your intended target actually can understand what you're trying to say, and we don't really have any evidence on that in our review. Um, as, uh, as Devin showed, that we can see that when you implement approaches uh, covering all three strategies, you have this pretty great increase in screening rate, but we don't really have that many uh, interventions where the only thing they did uh, was uh, increasing provider um, delivery of services were combining increasing access with increasing provider delivery. So if people are interested in delivering those kind of services, for example, combining provider reminder with some kind of reducing structural barrier um, intervention, that would be very interesting to us as well. Margaret, this is Heather. Um, I, yeah, such a great question. I, I think from our perspective, uh, there'd be a lot of questions. One, one that certainly comes to mind is implementation of evidence-based interventions within healthcare practices and, and how that is perceived from the provider level and, and what's the perceived value from their perspective. We're looking at all this from a public health perspective, but from a provider perspective, um, what are the benefits and um, are we addressing the barriers that, that they see? Because certainly there are quite a few. Um, the other, I think, is also just issues related to cost benefit, cost effectiveness. You know, when we can't make the case for um, why patient navigation should continue to be funding funded when grants end or, or funding uh, ceases, um, how can we help uh, make the case that, that that there is some some added value from a literal monetary uh, perspective? So I think cost effectiveness, cost benefit from all of these um, approaches. We definitely could use more information about that. Um, just as an add-on to the, to the last part, um, we're actually undertaking uh, economic evaluation of the multi-component cancer review. So that's, uh, that's our next, uh, hopefully uh, we'll be able to present, have some conclusions come out soon. So that's uh, looking at cost effectiveness and cost benefit of this kind of interventions. That's great. Thank you all so much. We have um, just had a flurry of questions come in, which is, Fabulous. So let's see how many we can um, get through before the top of the hour, and um, if not, and then look forward to continuing the discussion over on R two R. There are a couple of questions um, about copies of slides, and Heather, a question about the um, the webinar that that you mentioned the the um, the videos, and we'll. We'll be sending slides out um, if you request them um, through R2R happily at the end of this um, meeting. And we'll also be um, posting a link to the videos that, that Heather um, mentioned. Um, a question from Sherry Posner who asks, as a patient navigator, I find that women are avoiding breast cancer screenings due to fear, um, particularly those with strong family histories or do the cultural misperceptions such as fatalism. Any advice to address these barriers? Well, that's another excellent question. I, 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 I think, you know, patient navigation is one of those approaches that, that in the end becomes, a, you know, very individualized one-on-one -on -one kind of care. I don't specifically have the right thing that, that I would say to somebody except to, you know, utilize um, existing patient education materials, um, work with the person to understand um, a little bit more about what the fears are, and, and you know, maybe keep, um, you know, reaching out to them from time to time. They might not be ready the first time that somebody recommends a cancer screening to them, but, you know, they may have time to think about it themselves and, you know, they could be approached a second time or a third time and, um, you know, see if they're, they're their thoughts about it have changed. And then um, a question um, from Laura who asks, to decide on specific interventions, and happy um, for any of you, I think, to answer this, um, do you, Heather, do you um, use evidence from different neighborhoods or areas in terms of where the screening rates were particularly low? And um, similarly, down to CDC, um, in terms of targeting interventions, what, what does seem to work the best? What's been your experience? 
Well, so far, we, I mean, we absolutely try to know, you know, where, where our screening rates low, where we can get that information down, and we, we can't get much further down lower than like a county level for the most part. But um, really what we've tried to do is, is indirectly try to approach uh, populations where screening rates are lower by, by doing specific things and like working with federally qualified health centers or other types of primary care practices that serve underserved populations. Um, so we, we try to use a mix of both, but absolutely, especially in these times of um, dwindling resources, um, make efforts to target our resources where they're most needed. Great, thanks. Um, another question from Laura to you, Heather. Um, do you see any evidence showing that the law has impacted screening rates for breast cancer? Great question. So the, the laws that went into effect last year, no, we are monitoring that. Um, we were, our state is going to be um, following the BRFSS using the breast cancer screening module on an every year basis as opposed to the every other year so that we can monitor that closely. But no, so far we, you know, don't really have a way to know if that's had a measurable impact to date. Great, thanks. Um, a question from Beth Jones who asked um, about any experiences with um, promoting lung cancer screening. And um, Ian and Devin, maybe you could speak a little bit about um, resources on the community guide around lung cancer screening and um, the task force recommendations and then give Heather a chance to, to speak about New York State's experience. I'm, uh, I'm actually not quite uh, quite sure if we have a, a lung cancer screening review. Um, the, the closest thing we have are all the tobacco uh, control reviews that we have. Um, I think our, yeah, I think our cancer page is uh, focused on skin cancer and uh, breast, cervical, and colorectal cancer. And Margaret, uh, this is this is Heather. I we don't yet have um, experience with that. Uh, it's certainly on our radar. Is something that we we need to be um, looking for resources and. Um, resources really to to be able to implement. Okay. Well, and that's and that raises a good point that might be um a great topic for um for research to reality really kind of focus on do some of the legwork um around seeing what what other states and um tribes and territories are doing. That's a good question. Thank you. Um Another question from Sherry who says, and then we'll, we'll leave it at this, um, many women not coming back for further diagnostic testing after screening mammography because their insurance doesn't cover ultrasounds or the diagnostic mammography. Um, any advice if they still choose to remain in the imaging center of their choice or they, you know, what, what do you see happening in the field, Heather? Well, that is a, another very good question. Um, you know, I, I, I don't think I have enough information right now to be able to satisfactorily answer that question, um, but I would be happy to look into it offline and, and get back to you, Margaret, or, or the person asking. Uh, that might be a great way um, to segment. We have about five or six questions that we didn't um, get to. So what we're going to do is we'll move this discussion over on to um, the Research to Reality Community of Practice, and we'll be asking Heather and Devin and Ian to um, chime in on that platform and reach back out to everyone. And we, um, you know, we would encourage you to, to join the discussion on R2R as well. Um, I'll be sending a link to the feedback survey to all the registrants shortly, um, and as well as if you um, would like a copy of the slides, please email us. There's a contact form at Research to Reality, or you can email us at research to reality at mail.nih.gov. We'll be happy to send those slides to you. And, um, and again, we look forward to continuing this discussion on R2R, and the link is below. Thank you ever so much for 
joining us today, and thank you ever so much to our speakers. Really such a great topic and a robust um, set of questions, and so very appreciative, both for our speakers as well as all the participants for making this a truly interactive session. And I'm um, looking forward to seeing you online in our Duar. Thank you very much. Thank you. You may now disconnect. Thanks.